Welcome to session 11 of our study on the Gospel of John. In this session, we'll read and discuss the conclusion of the Passion narrative. We will finish chapter 18 and read all of chapter 19. We'll hear Peter's denial of Jesus, the arraignment before the high priest. There will be a trial before Pilate. Jesus will be flogged and mocked. He will be placed on a cross where he will die. Joseph of Arimathea is introduced to take charge of the burial. But first, we begin with a prayer. O oh God, our Father, open our eyes and enlighten our minds as we study your word. So grant that our minds may know your truth and our hearts may feel your love, and then confirm and strengthen our wills that we may go out to live what we have learned. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In our last session, we discussed the arrest of Jesus in the garden. There was no long prayer in the garden where the disciples kept falling asleep. Jesus went to the garden across from the Kindred Wadi or Kidron Valley with his disciples. Judas and the soldiers showed up and he was arrested. As we continue with chapter 18, Jesus is immediately arraigned before the high priest. John's narrative continues to run roughly parallel with the synoptics. All of the Gospels report Peter's threefold denial of Jesus centering around a hearing or trial before the high priest. So we begin with verses 13 and 14 of chapter 18. First, they took him to Ananias, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Only John reports the delivery of Jesus to Ananias, Caiaphas' father-in-law, at the same time correctly stating that Caiaphas was high priest that year. That year must refer to the year of Jesus' death. The high priest was not an annual office. Ananias had earlier been the high priest from 6 to 15 AD or CE and had been succeeded by several of his sons prior to his son-in-law Caiaphas, who was high priest for about 20 years. We notice in verse 14 that it says Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews. Of course, Caiaphas was a Jew, but remember that in John, the Jews referred to the authorities, especially the Pharisee authorities. The scene now shifts to outside the hearing room where Peter and an unnamed other disciple are following Jesus. So verse 15. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside of the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. So the other disciple is not named, just as the beloved disciple remains anonymous. This disciple now accompanies Peter the same way the beloved disciple appears in the company of Peter. No other gospel mentions either this figure or the beloved disciple. In John, it is the doormate who grants Peter's entrance at the behest of the other disciple who asks him about his relation to Jesus. Peter denies being one of the disciples, and the scene concludes with Peter standing by the fire, warming himself with the other members of the resting party. We go on to verse 19. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Ananias sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. The scene is shifted to inside the high priest's house, where he questions Jesus not about any threat to the temple or any claim to messiahship, as in Mark, 
but about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus then, in effect, says, why ask me? Ask those who heard me. The answer is not friendly or respectful and results in a blow to Jesus' face and an angry question. The question seems tiresome to Jesus. When struck, Jesus utters a measured and reasonable request, which receives no answer at all. Jesus is sent to Caiaphas, who is the actual high priest at this point. Ananias, who had been questioning Jesus, was a former high priest, a kind of high priest emeritus, perhaps. We go on to verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. So now, back to the courtyard where Simon Peter remains. A second time, he is questioned about his relationship to Jesus and denies it. A third and final challenge comes from a man identified very precisely. He is a slave of the high priest and a kinsman of the injured Malchus. This question locates Peter at the arrest scene. Peter again denies, and the cock crows, fulfilling Jesus' prediction as in the synoptics. There is no story of a trial by Sanhedrin or by the high priest Caiaphas in the fourth gospel. So we go on to verse 28. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to him, said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. So the trial before Pilate is the centerpiece of the Johnian Passion narrative. It is the one climactic event that decides Jesus' fate. If John knew of an account of Jesus' appearance before the Sanhedrin, he has suppressed it in order to focus entirely upon the one trial before Pilate, in which the Jews, in condemning Jesus, also condemn themselves. In the opening scene, Pilate goes outside the praetorium, which these adversaries have just refused to enter, and begins a conversation with the Jews, by identifying Jesus' accusers as the Jews the gospel aids and abets the impression, which was to grow throughout the centuries, that the Jewish people generally opposed Jesus to the death. This is not historically true. And in a couple of points in the trial before Pilate, Jesus' opponents were identified also as chief priests or chief priests and police, possibly provided a valuable clue as to who really were at the root of the opposition to Jesus. In John, but not in the synoptics, these events occur before the Passover. John may mention this by way of irony because the Jews do not appreciate how much greater defilement they are risking as they hound the Son of God to death. Pilate's question was direct and obvious. What accusations do you bring against this man? The response presupposes Jesus' guilt. Pilate doesn't know what Jesus is supposed to have done and his response reflects a disinterest in the whole matter. Jews in Judea, with few exceptions, were not permitted to carry out executions. So what they say here was probably historically accurate. Jesus was not a credible threat to Roman authority per se unless he could be portrayed as disrupting the status quo. The chief priests saw him as such a threat. So we go on to verse 33. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. 
but as it is, my kingdom is not here, not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? Are you the king of the Jews? In response to Pilate's question, found in all the Gospels, Jesus poses a counter question that already suggests his knowledge of conspiracy against him. Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate's response indicates that Jesus' knowledge is well-founded. Jesus speaks of his kingdom or kingship, depending on your translation. In saying that his kingdom is not of this world, Jesus implies that it is from God, although he does not say this directly to Pilate. Ultimately, Jesus, who has been turned over to Pilate, will be turned back over to the Jews, seemingly for execution. Pilate returns to the original question. Jesus responds in typical Johnian fashion by saying, you say that I am king. He states his purpose and mission, his own coming world, witness, truth. John's apparently mythological language is intended to interpret, not cancel out human historical realities. Pilate then reveals his own distance from Jesus, the truth by his question, what is truth? Of course, we see the irony of this question. We know Jesus, who is the truth, is standing right in front of him. Pilate's question reveals who he is and where he stands. Ultimately, he will be unable or unwilling to resist the forces bent on doing Jesus in. The end of verse 38 through the end of the chapter. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a rebel. Pilate has gone outside again to confront the Jews. His seemingly naive question shows that he scarcely begins to comprehend Jesus. He declares, in effect, that he finds Jesus innocent. In John, Pilate takes the initiative in offering to free Jesus according to custom. They, the Jews, instead call for the release of Barabbas, a rebel or a bandit, who has not been mentioned until now and is quickly forgotten in John's narrative. In chapter 19, the trial continues. Jesus is flogged and mocked and ultimately hung up on a cross to be executed. We will once again see Jesus' mother and the beloved disciple and Nicodemus, the Pharisee. Let's read the first three verses of chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. So Jesus is flogged and mocked. The mocking of Jesus is closely parallel in Matthew and Mark. So let's go on to uh, verse 4. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die because he has claimed to be son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. Pilate comes out of the building again, this time bringing Jesus with him, apparently to declare him innocent as he now says not once, but twice. Pilate shuttling back and forth seems out of character for a Roman governor, especially one of Pilate's proven toughness. However that may be, Pilate's behavior is extremely effective, literary device for portraying him as caught between opposing forces, as in some sense he was. It may be that John deliberately emphasizes Pilate's plight and exaggerates a sense of his entrapment for theological reasons,
Pilate's failure to make a decision for Jesus finally becomes a decision against Jesus, trying to find a basis to defend Jesus other than the truth of Jesus himself is only futile. When the crowd asked Pilate to crucify Jesus, he again claims he can find no case against him. The innocence of Jesus before Roman law was important for the early Christians to be able to affirm. Pilate's presentation of Jesus in his royal regalia allows the chief priests and police to call for his crucifixion. Probably the chief priests and police or, or officers are actually the same group that John elsewhere refers to as the Jews. Just as in other parts of the gospel, the Jews and Pharisees seem virtually synonymous. Subtly, John reflects a consciousness that the Jews, as he calls them, are essentially those Jewish authorities who oppose not only Jesus, but his disciples who form the post-resurrection church. In the Passion narrative, the Pharisees fade into the background, and the Jews are the chief priests and the officers, as indeed Jesus himself was opposed in Jerusalem by the temple authorities. Enormous issues are at stake here. Pilate, who had not understood Jesus' relation to the truth, is now said to be more afraid than ever, presumably in light of Jesus' alleged claim to be some sort of God appearing in human form. Pilate is being pushed into a corner here. We're going to verse 9. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against Caesar. Pilate asked Jesus about his origin, a natural question for a judge. Pilate may not hear the theological overtones of his question, yet at the same time, the question connects with the statement about Pilate's fear in view of the accusation that Jesus claims to be the Son of God. Jesus, in effect, acknowledges the correctness of Pilate's statement, that he has power over him. Pilate can dispose of Jesus, but having him crucified, he will only fulfill God's will. Once again, Pilate seeks to release Jesus. We read verse 13 through the first part of 16. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. Pilate's doubt about Jesus' guilt plays a role in every gospel but only in Luke and John does Pilate declare Jesus innocent. Here, Pilate's final attempt to release Jesus meets what can only be construed as a potentially stinging rebuke as the Jews call Pilate's loyalty to the emperor into question. In fixing the blame for Jesus' condemnation and death firmly on the Jews or the Jewish authorities, John brings to expression his own strong interest and belief. On the other hand, his portrayal of Pilate's behavior is anything but flattering. Pilate accedes to their wishes, although he knows better, and is in a different way also quite guilty. He could have stopped the execution and released Jesus, but he didn't. Indeed, his soldiers carried it out. As Pilate places Jesus before the Jews as their king, his pronouncement, Behold your king, parallels that from verse 5. In another irony, we consider the ancient historical debate about kingship. In 1 Samuel, the people demanded a human king over Samuel's objection. The people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, we are determined to have a king over us. 
In desiring an earthly king, the people reject the kingship of the Lord. Now they repeat that choice by choosing Caesar, the Roman emperor over Jesus. We read verse 17. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Those to whom Jesus is handed over, apparently the Jews, turn out to be the Roman soldiers after all. That Jesus carries his own cross seems at first glance an alteration to the synoptic narratives where Simon of Cyrene is impressed for that task. John emphasized that Jesus bears the cross by himself. The crucifixion of Jesus between two criminals is narrated as concisely as possible, and there is no mention here of their mocking or reviling Jesus. How Jesus was actually affixed to the cross is not said here, although the Johnian resurrection appearances accounts make clear that the nails were driven through his hands. The protests of the chief priests about the inscription naming Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, is understandable, as well as ironic, recalling their statement that they have no king but the emperor. They were perhaps also troubled that many of the Jews were reading the title. The chief priests appear to have won the dispute with Pilate because he accedes to the wishes. Yet in the end, Pilate prevails in that he crucifies Jesus as their king, not merely as one who made that claim. Therefore, Pilate's final retort has become a kind of byword, an expression of utter and complete finality. Now the scene shifts to the foot of the cross where the soldiers who have just crucified Jesus gamble for his garments. John quotes Psalms 22:18. We continue with the last part of verse 25. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own house. Jesus' mother and his beloved disciple stand together at the foot of the cross. Only in John do they appear here. The only woman mentioned in all of the Gospels is Mary Magdalene, who will later come to the tomb and find it empty. Jesus' mother now appears for the second time in the Gospel, bracketing Jesus' ministry, coming at his first public appearance and now at the end. This cannot be coincidental, but the meaning of her appearance is not immediately obvious. The beloved disciple is often seen as representing the witness undergirding this gospel. The mother of Jesus is frequently taken somehow to represent the people of God, Israel, and the church. Let's look at verses 28 through 30. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
The death of Jesus is narrated very briefly. There is no loud cry as he expires. There is no mention of darkness at noon or rending of the temple veil. There is no centurion's confession that Jesus was the Son of God. He says that he is thirsts only to fulfill scripture, perhaps Psalms 69, 21. The hyssop branch may suggest some tie-in with Passover. A hyssop branch would not support a wet sponge, so the hyssop must be in some way symbolic. Jesus' last words reiterate what he has said about finishing or completing the work the Father has given him to do. Jesus dies with dignity and seemingly at the moment he intends. The Johnny and Jesus is in control to the very end. Verses 31 through 37. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left in the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true. And he knows that he tells the truth so that you also may continue to believe. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. In John's Gospel, Jesus is crucified before the beginning of Passover, leaving the bodies exposed after sundown would in any event violate the law, all the more so because this was a very special occasion. The Jews, likely the chief priests, want them taken down to prevent such an offense. The soldiers, presumably Roman, break the legs of the two criminals crucified with Jesus, but not those of Jesus who had already died. When Jesus' side is pierced, blood and water come out. The blood may be symbolic of his blood shed for the many, the Eucharist. The water would then be the water of baptism. These also indicate both that Jesus really died and that he was really human. This scene could have been placed here to convey either or both of these extremely important theological ideas. We go to verse 38 through the end of the chapter. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb, which no one had ever been laid. So, and so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Joseph of Arimathea takes charge of the burial of Jesus. Joseph is described as a secret disciple because of his fear of the Jews. The Johnny and Passover context gives him a good reason as a pious Jew to get Jesus quickly buried. Only in John does Nicodemus appear at all, so his role in assisting Joseph is unique. The day of preparation, if it refers to preparation for the Passover and rather than the Sabbath, reflects the unique Johnian chronology, which motivates the hurried burial. That Jesus is buried according to the custom of the Jews is probably assumed, but not stated in the other Gospels. Since more than one body would be placed in a single tomb, it is significant that John tells us no one has ever been laid there. Scholars have naturally looked at the role of Nicodemus, with most commentators suggesting that he is coming, continually moving toward discipleship. Quite possibly he, like Joseph, belongs to the secret disciples who believe in Jesus but fear to confess him. Of course, John wants such disciples to make an open confession and leave the synagogue. The three appearances of Nicodemus and John seem to mark advances in his understanding, even if he has not yet arrived at an adequate and open confession. 
The account of Jesus' death is not surprisingly filled with Johnny and elements that point toward his major themes. Jesus sets out for Golgotha, needing no help in carrying out his own, carrying his own cross. The sign on the cross, which is in all the disciple, all the gospels, identifies Jesus as the king of the Jews, is according to John, written in three relevant languages, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, to make clear the universal relevance of what is transpiring. Jesus dies in complete control of the situation. No one takes his life from him. He gives it up as he gives over the spirit. And his final words indicate the completion of his work. What he says to the end fulfills God's will and, of course, scripture. The death of Jesus is obviously of central theological importance in this gospel. However, the typical early Christian language of cultic vicarious sacrifice found elsewhere in the New Testament is less prominent in the fourth gospel. Though clearly we are told the good, shepherd's lay, good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The Johnny in Jesus is omniscient, omnipotent throughout. He knows ahead of time of Judas' betrayal and of Peter's denial. Theologically viewed, the death of Jesus is his exaltation is being lifted up. His death is his exaltation from which he effects the salvation of humanity. In a similarly paradoxical way, Jesus speaks of his death as his glorification. Jesus' death reveals God and therefore reveals God's glory. In our next and final session, we will read chapters 20 and 21, the res resurrection narratives, the discovery of the empty tomb, the Mary's encounter, the appearances of his disciples, and also the epilogue, additional appearances of the disciples, and the appearance to Peter by the sea. Until then, be safe and have a good week. <laughs>